I just asked how many had an out-of-body experience, and it se seems like uh, 13 and a half of you did, um, and uh, that's about what, what we would expect. So what I'm going to do today is, uh, basically, I'm going to tell the story of my life. Because in a way, the story of my life, at least since 1970, is about out-of-body experiences. Uh, that was me in two guises, my hippie, far out man, wow, peace, and all that stuff, and dope smoking and, and dressing like that, and then there was the me student at Oxford in my gown, etc. That's the one that my mum liked. So, <clears throat> I go up to Oxford, 1970. I'd been at a really, really awful, ghastly girls' boarding school, like prison, and suddenly I'm in Oxford, and there's all these brilliant people around, and it's really exciting, and I'm getting up for nine o'clock lectures, going to bed at four in the morning, um, you know, really tired, um, spaced out. Um, and this particular night in November 1970, we'd been having a Ouija board session, which is not a very sensible thing to do, really. You know, after several hours of... I was a bit like this, and I was tired anyway. And I'd promised to go to a friend's room to uh, have a smoke. And uh, I'd smoked a little bit of cannabis, not very much. I, and I sort of thought, and I was sat on the floor listening to some music. What sort of music do you think that might have been? <laughs> Yay, Pink Floyd. <laughs> Actually, I don't know. I mean, it was either Pink Floyd or Grateful Dead. Um, but let's say it was Dark Side of the Moon or something like that. Anyway, so there I am, <clears throat> sitting cross-legged on the floor. <clears throat> and I'm going down a tunnel. And it's like a tunnel of trees. I took a photo this morning driving up here, but I didn't have time to put it in. And, um, but you can imagine, can't you? It, there's trees all around me with sort of like, like, you know, sparkly kind of, and a bright light at the end. And it was as though I was on a galloping horse or on a carriage or something. Dun -dun 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 I'm going down this tunnel towards the light. Dun -dun 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 -dun. And suddenly, there's three of us in the room, me, my friend Victoria, and Kevin. And Victoria said, do you want some coffee? And I was like, oh, what? I couldn't answer. And she said, no, 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 don't answer then, and went off out. And my friend Kevin said, where are you, Sue? Imagine someone asking you that question when you're just sat on the floor going down a tunnel. And I was like, um, um, well, uh, now I'm in Vicky's room. And suddenly everything went clear. And when I say went clear, some of you may have had this experience. You may have had it on the verge of sleep, or if you have certain types of meditation, you may have had it when suddenly everything is just amazingly clear. And I was on the ceiling, looking down, and there was Vicky out in the corridor, I could see through walls, my body down there, Kevin there. And I said, oh, I'm on the ceiling! And I saw the mouth down there going, I'm on the ceiling. Ugh, freak, freak, you know. Um, I've missed out the, uh, oh, that's a silly picture. <laughs> that was my kitchen in 1971 or something. Oddly enough, we've still got the same jars with, this, with the same writing of sugar. I mean, haven't we, Adam? Um, <laughs> they're still in, the, in, our, in our 2016 kitchen. Um, so this was my attempt to draw the tunnel the next day. So um, I said, I'm on the ceiling. And Kevin, who was really into astral projection and all that stuff, um, said, well, can you, can you move? And, and have you got a silver cord? And asked lots and lots of questions. And I had this silver cord coming out of my tummy and going down into the back of the neck down there. I said, yes, I've got a silver cord. And he said, can you move it? And I reached out my hand to move it, and it just moved by thought, not by my hand, you know? So, okay. And then he said, well, can you go anywhere? So I shot up through the roof, and I was looking down on all the roofs of Oxford, and I thought, ooh, I'll just check, because I'm kind of scientist at heart, you know. I'll just check the chimneys and the gutters and everything. And I sort of looked at whatever I could from above, thinking the next day I would go and check what they were really like. And then I set off. And I won't bore you with all the travels, because they are kind of boring. I went all over the place, around the world, and off to New York, and then the Mediterranean, and blah, blah, blah. Um, but the whole thing lasted about two and a half hours which is really exceptional now that I know a lot more about the subject. Um, it's normally quite brief. Um, average time is something like three minutes or whatever. Um, but it went on and on. And I attribute that partly to 
the state of mind I was in, this kind of sleep deprived, you know, and mainly to Kevin, who just kept on asking questions. I didn't have time to get frightened. I didn't have time to think about going back, not for quite a long time anyway. Um, and so off I went. Why I say that's boring? Because I want to tell you about two other things. One time I traveled off, I discovered that I had this complete extra body, but I didn't need it. I went down to the sea and became a sort of flat plate floating on the waves. And I could change my size and shape and all sorts of different things, which was very interesting. And it reminded me what little bit I knew about astral projection of thought rules in the astral world. And I could think anything and, and have some control over it. But after a quite maybe an hour, I really thought I'd better go back and make sure that things are okay. And there was still this cord that kind of went all the way back to Oxford somewhere, you know, the other side of the planet or whatever. And I followed that back and I went back into the room and there were the three people. But now my body was kind of didn't have a head on anymore, and the neck was sort of jagged, and, and, and it was really weird. And I, I, I just I thought, well, I can get back there, but I don't really like this. I tried to open my eyes. Nothing made sense, because when I did, it sort of whooshed over there. So I shut my eyes again, and I went off again and did a whole lot more travels. And then I got really tired, and I thought, right, this time I am really, really going to go back in, and I'm going to get inside that body and get back to normal. So... Can you imagine this? I mean, I know it sounds really weird, but are you kind of following it along in your imagination? So imagine now you come back, there's your own body down there with a jagged neck and no head, and I thought, I've got to get in there somehow, and I've got to go back to being normal. So I kind of went, got my, made myself go smaller, which was quite difficult, because I was really, you know, kind of weird shape. Got myself in, and I got smaller, but then I went smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And I got so small that I could just run around inside the body. And I said, no, you've got to, this is all wrong, you know, this is... And I was like, my legs like this, so I kind of went up the leg and then wee down there. And, and I mean, it was ridiculous stuff. Anyway, then I thought, you've got to get to the right size. So I tried to make myself bigger, and I got bigger, and I just about got to the right size, but I didn't stop. And I went on and on and on and on. And I just got bigger and got the size of the earth, and got this, the moon came in, and then planets, and then stars, and then I just went into everything. And there wasn't any me, or if there was a me, it was everything. And there wasn't really any everything, because although there was kind of stuff, there wasn't time and space didn't mean anything anymore. And there was just this amazing sense of, ah, this is how it is. This is right. This is, this is how it is. This is a kind of everything and not me. And I, Some of you will know from experience, some of you will know from reading what I'm trying to describe or what I think, because this is now, how long ago is 1970? Um, 46 years ago. And yet, it's still very vivid in my memory. So there I was... Like, well, this is obviously it. This is all there is to it. This is, this is kind of the end, you know? And then Kevin said, <laughs> he said, well, what, what now? Can't you go any further? And part of me is going, well, no, uh, there isn't a me to go any further. I mean, you know, that sort of thing. And, but then another part's going, well, maybe. And it was like another world opened up like a kind of cloud, and there was a sense of some kind of being that was observing me with a sort of kind amusement. And I just was left with the words, however far you go, there's always something further. And at that point, I was utterly exhausted. This is two and a half hours later, after all I've described. And I just had to get back. And it was a grueling half an hour of systematically telling myself what the normal illusion of self is. I wouldn't have put it that way then, but I would now. I had to talk myself back into the illusion of being Sue Blackmore in that body, relating to those people over there, instead of being everything. And I said, you've got to go back inside the body and look out through the eyes. If you want to go anywhere, you've got to take the body with you. Well, eventually, I needed a wee. And it's pretty obvious that if you need a wee, you've got to take the body with you. And <laughs> you can't send your astral body off to do it for you. So I, I managed it. Uh, I got back and I was like, kept drifting off 
one way and the other, and you know, it was quite difficult, but I managed it, and Kevin sort of helped me to get up and go down the corridor to the loo. And um, he said, if I fell asleep, because he was into astral projection, he said, if I fell asleep, my astral body would leave and never come back and I'd die. So he kept me awake the rest of the night. And the next day I rode my bicycle and I was over here watching myself on the bicycle and I thought I was going to fall off. <laughs> and this went on for a while. And I went to a tutorial. You know, in, in Oxford you have these personal tutorials with your tutor. And... Um, and after a while, she said to me, now pull yourself together, Susan Blackmore. You look as if you're floating all over the room. <laughs> and I went, I am, I am. Oh, oh. And so I poured out the whole story to her. And she was like, you and these, all these drugs, you students these days. And blah, blah, blah. Um, anyway, so that's my story. But, oh, well, thank you for that little wow. I mean, I still, I still feel a sense of, of kind of wow. Um, and it's very nice being here at Sand because I feel that, that talking to you, you can kind of empathize with this strange experience. Well, as I said, I'm kind of a scientist at heart, so there were all these questions. Now, any of you who are old enough, I can see a few of you who are, may know that in 1970, it was the tail end of behaviorism. All we were learning in the My Psychology degree, there's some nodding going on, was um, rat, running rats in mazes and learning about memory. Nothing was known about how memory works, really. Um, but we were trying to find out, and then chopping up rat brains and injecting them with this and that. And it, there wasn't anything, nothing, nothing about consciousness. You couldn't even mention the word consciousness. That was taboo. And there wasn't anything in my degree. I was doing physiology and psychology, which, which in any way touched on any of this. And I thought, right, all my scientist teachers, you know, my lecturers and professors and whatever, they're all wrong because I know that I have left my body. And there's more to this world than just physical stuff and brains and all that. I know that because it's happened to me. But I want to find out why and how. And I am, you know, this is, you remember, I'm, I'm, I'm 19. I'm going to prove to the world that there's more in your philosophy than whatever, you know? More than ever dreamt of in your philosophy. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I, I went outside the next morning and I had seen iron gutters and uh, big brick chimneys. The gutters were plastic, modern white ones, and there weren't any chimneys. Well, never mind, everything on the astral plane is not exactly the same as the physical plane, so I won't worry too much about that. So, I decided that when I'd finished my degree, I was going to become a parapsychologist, because I now believed in telepathy, clairvoyance, precognition, psychokinesis, life after death, spirits, souls, astral planes, um, uh, uh, crystal ball gazing, uh, tarot cards. I mean, I trained in all these things. I became a witch and went in the coven and blah, 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 did all this stuff. And, um, and I believed everything. This is understandable. I can understand um, uh, what happened. I mean, I can understand why I had that belief. I want to just move on to this. Uh, Thomas Metzinger is a well-known German philosopher. He does uh, philosophy of ethics and all, all sorts of interesting things. And he's had many out-of-body experiences. And he said, for anyone who actually had that type of experience, it's almost impossible not to become an ontological dualist. And he's right. Ontological dualist meaning the sort of dualist who actually believes there are two kinds of stuff in the world. Mind and brain, or spirit and body, or astral and physical, or, you know, ontology meaning what exists. So, I think he's right about that. Well, here we are at sand, science and non-duality. That's why I said right at the beginning that this kind of experience is ideal for, for sand because it seems to be a dualistic experience. It seemed to me utterly to prove dualism at the time. But does it? I would like to ask you that question um, so I'm going to give you two options. You think something left the body and went off somewhere, or you think nothing left the body. So, hands up who thinks that something went out of my body and went off somewhere. Put them properly up. 
so I can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. How many think nothing left the body? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. And who didn't put their hand up? <laughs> the vast majority didn't put. Pardon? Okay, what's the third option? <laughs> Don't preempt everything. <laughs> uh, yes, that's fine. Um, right. These are the obvious options. Of course, there are, there are other options which I will come to. But um, obviously, dualism is the default position. It's been the default in history. Uh, I've just put up a few pictures there. That's Ba and the mummy, uh, an Egyptian concept of the spirit leaving the body at death. The astral projection, Muldoon and Carrington. Modern stuff, there's a lot of, not a lot, but there are several um, doctors and, and scientists uh, claiming that consciousness can leave the body uh, in near-death experiences, and they have pictures like this, which are very popular. I have got a stack this high of books called things like Proof of Heaven, Heaven is for Real, I Went to Heaven and Came Back, and I'm reading my way through them. <laughs> and they all have been bestsellers and make millions. Yes, I was. I was wearing probably jeans and a t-shirt. Um, I might have been wearing my lovely, droopy, colorful, fluffy thing that I often wore, but I definitely clothes, yes. Um, and of course, the major religions, the, the, um, the great uh, monotheistic faiths are all founded on duality and on life after death, that our spirit survives. Um, so, and, and it's the default position also in the sense of, of the, um, the psychology of child development, which shows how early on in childhood we become dualists. So children of about three or so are already discriminating between living things and non-living things. And by the time that, and things that move and things that don't move and are self-moving, and they have a concept of almost like free will, which I'll talk about on Saturday. Um, that comes very early. And by the age of about four, if you ask them what happens when people die, they say, well, they're not hungry anymore because they don't need a body, but they still love their mummy and they still think and, and so on. So these concepts come very early. Throwing off that kind of dualism is therefore not, not easy. Um, but we know that, don't we? Um, us at Sand trying to, uh, to understand non-duality. Um, I I'm now want to have a go at what we know about out-of-the-body experiences and tell something about how the science there has changed. It's important to start with a good definition. This is one that I used in the first book I wrote about out-of-body experiences, which was called Beyond the Body, and was published in 1982. And I absolutely did my best then to understand what was going on. But we didn't have the science, we didn't have the neuroscience, we didn't have the psychology, we didn't have a whole lot of things that we have now that will enable me to tell you a bit more. But I did my best. Now that the science has changed so dramatically, uh, I'm writing um, another book, <laughs> which I thought would be easy, and it's taking me a lot longer than I thought. Um, but this is the science that I want to tell you about. So the, this definition is important because it's a neutral definition. An out-of-body experience is an experience in which you seem to perceive the world from a location outside your physical body. So according to this definition, if you've had that sense that you are looking down or you're up there or you're somewhere else and it r feels absolutely real, you have had an out-of-body experience. Note the word experience. It's an experience of seeming to be out of the body. I'm laboring this a bit because it's important that that doesn't prejudge any theory. So we can start neutrally. There have been some early scientists of OBEs who only accepted ones that had some evidence that something had really left. And that just confuses the issue. We need to start with a, an open definition and then work our way towards understanding what's going on. So here are just some very basic facts um, about OBEs. As I mentioned earlier, there have been lots and lots of surveys in lots of different countries um, and in different special groups. Um, but roughly speaking, in the general population, it's pretty common 
8 to 20% have had it. And there are no differences in terms of sex, age, education, and all, all sorts of things of that kind. They just don't seem to matter at all. Um, there's some odd things about children. Very often adults claim they had OBEs as children, but children very rarely claim they have them. So there's something funny going on there. <clears throat> they mostly happen when people are lying down or sitting, quite often sitting in meditation, but definitely relaxing. But oddly enough, they mostly happen when people are lying on their back. And this becomes Im important later. Um, and of course, they happen close to death and on the edges of sleep and so on. The same people who have out-of-body experiences also have lucid dreams and sleep paralysis and are more likely to believe in the paranormal and they have what's called temporal lobe lability. That is the temporal lobes here on either side of the brain um, are more unstable, more active, more responsive to, to different things, more changeable. Now we know that p when people have temporal lobe epilepsy and then they have serious <laughs> random firing in the temporal lobes, they get mystical experiences, out of body experiences, deja vu, a whole lot of things like that. Um, but there's a range in normal people of how labile your temporal lobes are. If they're very, very stable, you're likely to be a quite steady sort of serious person and uh, not have weird experiences. And if you have high temporal lobe lability, it's, it's, more, it's more fluid. And, and there's a big range. So there's a, there's a lot of things like that, that that the research has shown. But let's come to the big question. Did somebody say something? Oh, sorry. Um, does anything leave the body? So the exomatic theories are the ones that people tend to like. And um, I don't know if any of you have tried any of these methods. Uh, you go online and say how to do astral projection, you will get a flood of stuff. I particularly like this astral projection powder. <laughs> I'm not sure what you have to do with it. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I like the one that goes to future, past, or present. Go anywhere you like. Um, and there's astral projection uh, liquid. There's all sorts of things. Um, and there are books. I've, I've been tracking these online. Uh, there used to be books that said astral projection in three weeks. And then they become three days. And I even found one last week that said astral projection in 10 minutes. So um, it's getting quicker. Now, what are the objections to uh, the idea that something leaves the body? Well, they're pretty obvious. What is it? Where does it go? They're all the problems of dualism. If there's some other thing, some spirit or soul, how does it communicate with the physical world? This is the fundamental reason why almost every scientist and philosopher in the world rejects dualism in its ontological form, in its Cartesian, Descartes, uh, mind and body separate form. Because if you have a physical world and a mental world, how on earth are they going to communicate with each other? If they really do communicate, then they're not totally different things. If they're totally different things, as they appear to be, then they're not going to be able to communicate. And if they can't communicate, then you can't make any sense of why taking LSD sends you on a trip or why banging yourself on the head knocks you out. Um, dualism doesn't work. So. There's plenty of objections along those lines. Now, I know that here at this conference, not necessarily in this room, are people who believe in the subtle energy body, uh, paranormal powers, all these kinds of things, um, and are therefore dualists. Um, I think dualism is hopeless, <laughs> uh, but I, I won't go on about it. But one of my favorite objections is not that basic one, this is uh, by uh, William Rushton, a famous vision scientist, who said that, um, what is this out of the body eye that can encode the visual scene exactly as does the real eye with its 100 million photoreceptors and its million signaling optic nerves? If this floating replica is to see, this is the logic, it's wonderful. If it's, if it's to see, it must catch light, and hence it cannot be... Uh, and hence it cannot be transparent, and so it must be visible to people in the vicinity. It's a lovely point. If it's going to see, it's got to catch light. If it catches light, it's opaque. You would see it. 
Ah, uh, of course there are objections to the objections. The astral projection people will say, don't be stupid, the astral, you're traveling in the astral worlds, not the physical world, of course you can't be seen. And there'll be countless ways around it. Now maybe people will find a way that really makes sense of these um, spirits, astral bodies, subtle energies, and all these things. Maybe they will. Uh, I haven't seen any, any such evidence. What happened to me when I, I had this great heroic, you know, I'm going to prove to the world um, that all these things exist. I did become a parapsychologist. I actually managed to find a university that would allow me to do a PhD on telepathy. I had a wonderful theory of telepathy that information was all stored in the Akashic records and that memory in, in our brain is really, it's not really in our brain, we're reaching out but telepathically, when we remember things ourselves, we're reaching our own Akashic records, but we can, if we're really sympathetic with someone or close to them, um, we can reach out to theirs and therefore telepathy is possible and so on. So I set about doing experiments on memory and ESP, which I did for years and years and years and years, and I got my PhD and I went on and I never found any evidence whatsoever of any paranormal phenomena. I can't tell you how many haunted houses I've slept in, how many poltergeists I've sat in the poltergeist house and watched a clock jump along the mantelpiece and then found out what was wrong with the clock and, you know, endless things. And how many spirit mediums I've been to and trained in table turning and blah, 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 blah. Never in all those years did I ever find any convincing evidence of any paranormal phenomena. That doesn't mean there aren't any, but that was my very determined life. And when people say to me, you're so close-minded, you should... I say, well, you go and do 10 years of experiments and statistical analysis and trying everything you know how, and, you know, then I'll listen to your opinion. A bit stuck up of me, but I can tell you it was very hard work. And it was, it was an awful moment when I was lying in the bath one night and I thought, well, I've discovered this doesn't exist, but I'm sure this does. Well, that doesn't, but I'm sure this does. Well, maybe that doesn't, but this does. And I just lay there one night and went, you know what? What if it's all rubbish? All of it. And there I was with my flowing stuff and my crystal ball. And, you know, that's who I was. That was my identity, was she's the psychic, you know, all that. And I had to com completely change, except for my hair. <laughs> um, so, when it came to the end of the road, really, of the parapsychology. I knew I'd had an out-of-body experience. And so, and, and always, you know, trust people that when they talk about their experiences, I'll, I'll listen to their experiences, yes, but it's the interpretation that's so difficult. And people jump to interpretations. So I wanted to find out. So the, one of the problems is you can't, um, you can't uh, get somebody and take them into a scientific laboratory and go, right, sit down there and have an out-of-body experience and now I'll measure you. Why not? Because there's almost nobody who can do that. There are a few people, and it has been done, but it's really hard. And anyway, that might sort of spoil the whole thing. But what I did was I kept meeting people, obviously, in the life I was leading, who had um, these experiences. And one of them, um, who ran a magazine called Astral Today or something, um, he said that he could, at home, in bed, leave his body and travel anywhere he wanted to go. And he visited me at my house, and he said, if you put some um, words and numbers and objects and things on your kitchen wall, I will go out of my body in the night, and I will come and visit your kitchen, and I'll write a letter. This is long before email, of course. I'll write you a letter and tell you what I saw. And that started what I did for many, many years. And I had... Uh, 20 words, I randomly chose one every Sunday night and put it up on the wall. I had 20 small objects, put one of them up, and um, a five-digit number, which of course is a lot more possibilities. And over the years, three people ever wrote to me and said they'd seen it, um, and nobody got them right. Now, this doesn't prove that nobody ever could, but it was just another nail in the coffin for my certainty that my astral body had left my physical body. So let's have a go at the other kinds of theory. Um, remember I began with the tunnel. 
And this tunnel experience is actually very common in near-death experiences, but also in other situations. Hands up if anyone has found themselves, as it were, going down a tunnel towards a light. One, two, three, four, five, six, oh, quite a lot of you, about a dozen. Pardon? Not towards a light, but just going down a tunnel. Yes, it doesn't always have to have a light. Uh, sometimes it can be going towards a dark or a red hell-like place or all sorts of things, but the most common is the light. Um, Note this picture. This picture is um, from Ron Siegel, who did a lot of research on LSD and psilocybin, and this is someone um, after an LSD trip um, drawing what they saw. Hundreds and hundreds of television sets, each one with a picture. This one is from a man called um, David Howard, who wrote to me, he has narcolepsy, which means he falls asleep unpredictably in the day. And he was abducted by aliens. I did a lot of work with alien abductees and uh, met all the hypnotists and lots of people who'd been abducted and so on. Um, and um, he goes down this tunnel. Very often when the spaceship comes and gets him, they send him down the tunnel and he emerges on another planet. But isn't it interesting that it's uh, very similar? So why should these be similar in such very different situations? Well, the answer was actually already known in the 1980s, although I didn't know it then. It was much later that I read all this research. But if you think about the way the visual system works, information goes in through the eyes, goes up the optic nerve, through the thalamus, and into the visual cortex. The V1 at the very back of the head is the first primary visual cortex that does the early processing. And the way it's organized is if you map what would be straight lines in the cortex, and it's all in columnar organization, with straight lines onto the outside world, it maps as circles. So when you see a circular, circular thing in the outside world, that's giving information in a straight line in the cortex. Now, if for any reason you've got random firing in the cortex, which you will get with LSD, psilocybin, on the verges of sleep, near death, because all of these things affect the inhibitory neurons, so they stop inhibiting, and all the excitatory neurons get more excited, and you get waves of activity. Those waves of activity will look like circles. And as the activation increases, the circles will get bigger, and, and you'll get this sense of moving down a tunnel. In fact, you can think of it in even simpler ways, and I did very simple computer simulations back in the early 90s of increasing random activity in, in the whole visual system should produce, at the beginning, a little bright light in the middle, which gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And if you are paralyzed in sleep paralysis, or half asleep, or in any of sort of odd states of consciousness, and you've got your eyes shut, you've got no reference point. So this thing coming bigger, this bright light getting bigger and bigger, it will you know, seem to come towards you, and you get sucked into it. Uh, the tunnels are widespread through cultures. You know, lots of indigenous cultures using ayahuasca and other drugs are very familiar with tunnels. They appear all over the place, and this is the reason why. But back to the out-of-body experience. We were still floundering at the end of the last century about what's happening, and I got quite... I still get annoyed with the kind of skeptics who say, well, we know it's all hallucination. Well... Why that hallucination? Why that feeling? Why the realness of it, the amazing vividness of what we see, you know? Why all that? Well, suddenly everything changed in 2002. Uh, a neurosurgeon called Olaf Blanke in Switzerland was doing a really dangerous operation. There was a woman with such terrible epilepsy that she could not really cope with life, seizures, you know, many, many a day. And they couldn't find the seizure focus in her brain. So what they did was put under the skull, under the bone, right against the dura, sub, and right under the dura, subdural electrodes. They're between the main, um, right on the surface of the brain, um, an array of electrodes. And he could then stimulate pairs of electrodes or more all over that thing and to see where he would set off a seizure to find where the focus was. And he could then remove that bit of brain and she might stop having seizures, which indeed was true. She did, and she was fine. But when he stimulated that spot on the right temporoparietal junction, that's there, where the temporal lobe meets the parietal lobe, it's there. 
she said, oh, my legs are getting longer. Oh, my legs are getting shorter. Oh, my arms are going up. Oh, and so on. And when he increased the current, oh, I'm out of my body. I'm on the ceiling. I'm looking down. I mean, she's saying all this because you don't need anesthetic because the brain doesn't have any pain nerves in it. Um, so she's talking about it. And he was able to repeatedly bring her back, make her go up again, give her stretching body. I mean, think of my getting bigger and smaller and all that. He could produce these things by that spot. So we now know, or at least that's a hint that this might be how you produce out-of-body experiences. More of the, re the research they did, this is just a plot of people who have out-of-body experiences, um, people with brain damage, and people who have autoscopy, which is a different pathological experience in which you see like a doppelganger. You see another version of yourself over there. You're still in your body, but there's a you over there, another one. And they are in different places. And you can see that one, two, and three um, are where you would expect on the right temporoparietal junction. Well, I say so what? Because does finding the place in the brain that sets it off kind of answer the questions? No. Do you remember all that publicity about the God spot? Yeah? And it's like that. You know, you find the God spot, the place in the left temporal parietal lobe somewhere, where, you know, nuns in deep meditation or Buddhist monks or whatever, there's more activity there as they get into deep states. Well, some people say, well, there you are, you see. Mystical experiences are perfectly natural and come from the brain. And other people are saying, ha-ha, that's the place where God communicates through us through. So you, you get nowhere. So it could be like that. So we need to know what the right temporoparietal junction is doing. And that might help us. And indeed, it does. It turns out that that part of the brain is ideally suited where it is. It's right near the junction of these two major lobes and actually not far from the occipital lobe, which is the visual stuff. And it's actually constructing our sense of self. It's bringing together touch, sight, hearing, uh, some aesthetic, or uh, well, the feeling of where your body is, vestibular information, which is why lying on your back is important, because it upsets the vestibular system, all the stuff from your ears. It's putting all this together so that your body, ha you have a body schema, like where, I mean, wriggle now. It's so natural to, you can feel where you are, can't you? It's amazingly quick. All the time your brain's doing that, keeping track of where you are. Um, and that's all put together with vision and uh, all the other senses to give a body schema. And then, in combination with um, the parietal lobe and the prefrontal cortex, yeah, somewhere, um, is giving a sense of, oh, well, I'm me, this is my name, this is who I am, this is where I am, and so on. That's the job of that part of the brain. So no wonder if you stick an electrode in it and bzzz, it, these things fall apart. The self starts to fall apart. We're so, a brain is so determined to produce a body schema. In fact, we know it's actually genetically inbuilt to have two arms, legs, and everything. Even people born without arms have a body schema with arms. And a bit like phantom limbs, it's a bit of a problem, but um, we know that. So the brain is always trying. So it's going to try and make one anyway. And therefore, it makes some kind of sense that it will make another one. It's trying to get them together. Like in my experience, it was so hard to pull them back. But it's still making the body schema. It's still trying to do its job. Now, one clue that we have to this is um, just a little test. So I'm going to give you this little test. In these pictures, um, in each one, one of the hands is gray. Can you see that? OK, I'm going to shout out the letters, and I want you to shout out left or right, according to which is the gray one. Ready? OK. C, A, D, B, very good. Uh, I didn't hear any wrong ones. Yeah, a clever lot, because I often get people shouting out the wrong one. Um, yes, those were all correct. But the interesting thing is that is a task that requires activity in the right parietal junction. So these, there are lots of other, I've just given you this one example, but there are lots of other tests that show that, that that's the area that is involved in mapping bodies, thinking about where bodies are and which way around they are and all that kind of thing. 
Have any of you come across the rubber hand illusion? Yeah, quite a few of you. Okay, good. I forgot to bring my rubber hand. I, I, I like to dem get a demonstration, but I think it's too difficult without my rubber hand. Um, but for those of you who haven't come across this, it's, a very, it's now a very famous psychological experiment. This effect was discovered at a party in 1998 by two psychologists who were larking around in a Halloween party with rubber hands. I expect they had blood and stuff dripping out and all that, you know. But anyway, what they ended up with the experiment was, uh, imagine I'm the subject, okay? And I now put my left hand in a box so I can't see it. And it's there. And here's my right hand. And here is a rubber hand. Literally, you know, flabby pink thing. But I can't see my left hand. And now, the naughty experimenter comes along with two paintbrushes, <clears throat> and he paints like this. I mean, not with paint, just the brushes. Brushes the rubber hand and the real hand, which I can't see. So I can see this rubber hand being stroked, and I can feel the stroking on my own hand. So what do you think happens? Hmm? What? Yeah, but what does it feel like? Hmm? Yes. Yes, exactly, exactly. So we're used to looking at something touching us like there's a fly, you know? Sight and touch come together. That's how we've been all our lives. And now we've got sight here and the feeling, and we put the two together, and people start to feel that the rubber hand is their own. And it's very weird. If you read the literature on it, it sounds like it works every time. It doesn't. But you can measure where they think their hand is, and it's what's called proprioceptive drift. Their sense of where their hand is kind of drifts towards the rubber hand. And quite a few of my students have done experiments on this, and it, 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 it does work, just not as magically as the popular press would, would have you say. But it appears that sight in humans sighted humans, it's our most powerful sense, and it will override other information, like the not terribly good feeling of exactly where our hand is, is not as powerful as the vision. Well, some experimenters decided to think, well, could we make an out-of-body version of this, like a whole body illusion? And what they did was this. Now, I'm going to need a couple of volunteers for this. Um, uh, let me see. What's the best way to do this? Um, I'll be the camera. Could I have two volunteers, please? Oh, thank you, Adam. Uh, wonderful. I'd like you to both stand up on here, please. Right, you stand here. Yeah. What's your name, please? Tamar. Tamar. Could you just step out of the way for a moment? Okay. This is my experimental subject. I'm a camera, right? And there's a camera here. Um, now, what's going to happen is uh, I'm going to put on his head a virtual reality thing, okay? Yeah, you can, you can pretend this is your, put your, put your hand, that, this, he's got this thing on his head, okay? Now, that is showing him the picture from here, right? So what's he seeing? You go and be his back, will you? So you go and stand there. Two meters, there. stop, that's fine. No, the other way around. So now... I'm the camera, he's seeing his own back, right? Now what do I do? Now what's he seeing? Hmm? Yeah, what's he going to see? Two meters in front of him, what's he see? Yes, he sees a hand stroking his, they do it with a stick. He sees a stick stroking his back. So he is watching his own back and he's feeling it at the same time. So if it's like the rubber hand, what's going to happen? Yeah, he's going to think he's there. He's going to drift forwards. And that's what happens. Some people in this experiment literally feel they've shot forwards and they're in there. Other people just feel that they're drifting forwards, and then you can measure the drift. So that's one way of making an out-of-body sensation. Thank you very much. Um, I need you to, I'll keep you here to do another experiment. <laughs> she was a fantastic back, wasn't she? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
<laughs> yes, yes, absolutely right. It's a slight, a bit of a stretch, isn't it? But <laughs> wear smart clothes. <laughs> yes, you have indeed. Okay, now this one is rather more difficult. Uh, to explain. The reason I get the volunteers is because if you read about these experiments, it's really hard to work out what's going on, especially in this one, which is a bit more complicated. So, um, I want you, please, to uh, sit in the chair, Adam, and um, I think I only need Adam this time. Thank you, Tamar. Uh, I don't need your back anymore. Thank you very much. Right, here, can you move forward a bit? Sorry. So here I am again, and I'm the camera. I need a stick. Have we got a stick of any kind? Anyone got anything that looks like a stick? Pen yeah, pencil would be great. And now you haven't got one for yourself, but thank you. So this is a, a, a totally different attempt. Here's the, let's say this is the camera, all right, this thing here. Now, what I want you to do before we begin is take a pencil or something like that, or your finger will do if you can't, and I want you to go like this. Stroke your own chest but make sure that your finger or pencil comes up where you can see it, and I want you to look straight ahead at me while you do it. Okay, now what are you seeing? Hmm? What do you see? You. See me, and what happens to me? You, can you see your pen you know, appearing and disappearing like that, yes? So you should be seeing the, the world around you, but this pen going like this, and feeling the stroking on your chest. Yeah, can you all do that? Okay. Right, so what this guy did, Erson, here's a camera. He simultaneously went like this, stare ahead. He went like this, and he's wearing his thing. Um, he went like this, and he went like this, in front of the camera. If that's the lens, it's like that. So what's going to happen now? Work it out. It's very complicated. Hmm? At the same time, see the sticks and feel uh, on the body the same movement. Yes. So what's, what's that going to do to him? Exactly right. It creates the sensation the sticks moving on his body. On top of his body. Yeah, go on. Go on. Just imagine it. You feel... Yes, it makes him go backwards. Exactly. <clears throat> because what he's seeing through his headset is what you were seeing, but it's coming from over here, and he's watching the back. He's watching his own back. He can't see the stroking on there. He's watching his own back, which nothing happening to it, but he's seeing the, this thing happening here, right? So here, he's kind of seeing this thing. So what happens in the first experiment, they seem to go forwards, and in this experiment, seem to come back, which is much more like a normal out-of-the-body experience, where you tend to go behind your body and look. You tend to go above and behind. So all our lives, if something's gone like this, which seems a bit unnatural, but of course you often see things coming towards you and disappearing. So it's doing what it's done all its life, but it's deluded by the camera. Partly it's our lifetime experience, partly our, it's our genetics, and we're built that way through evolution. Um, and that means we're always trying to make sense of it in a familiar way. It doesn't mean there are things that we're completely in, invisible or, you know, but it does mean that we're very prone to making things seem more familiar than they really are and missing all sorts of interesting things because our normal ways of trying to make sense don't work. So, yes, the implications of this go a lot wider than, than the OBE. But back to natural out of body experiences, these were not like. I mean, nobody who's done this experiment, and I mentioned Thomas Metzinger, he's one of the experimenters and subjects in these. He said it's not like an ordinary out-of-the-body experience. It's kind of like it, but it's not got the vividness. And anyway, it's the picture you're seeing is from a camera. Not, you're not with your eyes shut seeing it from wherever the astral world comes from. Nevertheless, it's giving us a big clue about how easy it is to change our sense of where we are. And lots and lots more experiments have been done with robotic stroking devices where you can lie somebody and even put them in an fMRI scanner. And guess what happens when they go in an fMRI scanner? Yes, it's the right temporoparietal junction that is get, having the most activity um, when these things happen. 
I just want to mention a few other things they've discovered, because this is very interesting. They can measure, <coughs> they can measure the proprioceptive drift. So when Adam was here, can measure where he felt he was, how far out of the body he felt his location to be. And um, when you do that, you find that the more somebody feels they're out of their body, the less pain they feel. So classic pain experiments, you put a hand in ice water and it's really painful but doesn't do you any harm. They'll feel that less when they're in this experimental situation and feel that they're somewhere else. They feel less social anxiety. You can provoke social anxiety with various you know, things that make you self-conscious and they feel it less. They also feel less, um, uh, the body temperature drops, <coughs> not a lot, but a little bit. And one experiment in Ayrson's, he went up to the people while they're, like Adam was, with a big knife and went, just stop short, of course. And you get a GSR response, sweating on the palms, in, you know, all sorts of uh, easily measurable stress response. And that was less. The more, the further away the people felt they were, the less that response. I say this is important because there are lots and lots of people who use out-of-body experiences as a way of escaping childhood sexual abuse, um, violence, all kinds of fearful situations, um, attacks, rape, so on and they'll go out their body. And so it's interesting to find that it really does have this kind of effect. Um, better if these horrible things didn't happen, but it, to some extent, is a way of coping with such things. Well, in the end, and I'm stopping a minute, in the end, as the man at the back said right at the beginning, this raises questions about self and who am I, which, of course, are fundamental to all of us here at Sand. Uh, that comes back to that. And if we think we are a ghost in a machine, like this nice little cartoon here, that's how we feel, that's how it seems. But it really isn't that way. The self is kind of not like that. People have been saying this for a very long time. Of course, the Buddha with the concept of anatta and the self as no self, or the, the Buddhist idea that the self is not permanent uh, a permanent entity having a stream of experiences, it's endlessly re reconstructed, they wouldn't put it that way, but endlessly reappearing, re-arising uh, out of conditions. Everything is causes and conditions, selves arise and fall away, self is impermanent like everything else. That's going back, you know, two and a half thousand years. Uh, William James, one of my great heroes, said, thought itself is the thinker, and psychology need not look beyond. And you can read these for yourself. I particularly like the one from Rick Hansen, which is a, a book on, on Buddhist psychology. And he asks, is the self like a unicorn, a mythical being whose representations exist, but who is actually imaginary? And that's exactly how I think it is. These representations built by this clever brain, putting together touch, sight, sound, feeling, vestibular sensations, get it really, they get it really good. They get it like this, I can, this thing can control the body. This thing really, this representation here is in charge. It feels as if it has free will. I'm talking about that on Saturday. Um, it feels as if it has free will, that it's in charge, that it is a thing and that it persists. Um, that's a very clever trick the brain pulls off. And the out-of-body experience, if you think this way, is a way of, um, of, 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 of realizing that. It's looking now, I mean, I think all this is changing very much. The, the psychology and neuroscience of self is really steaming ahead in the last five years, maybe. And it looks like there are four different aspects that the brain has to put together. Where am I? My location, embodiment, this, I'm in here. First-person perspective, where I'm looking from which is what those experiments with the virtual reality took apart. Ownership, this is my body. When I was on my outer body experience, that was my body down there, but my first person perspective was up there. So first person perspective is separated from ownership. And agency, the sense of agency in an out of body experience, agency goes out there uh, and that body is passive. But in other weird experiences, it, it's split up in a different way. So we're gradually kind of getting to how this illusion of self is constructed in a brain. And uh, Thomas Metzinger uh, reckons that we, um, 
that out-of-body experiences have been one of the things that just add to our feelings of being a self, when in fact now it's giving us a way out. So my feeling now is over 46 years, did I say it was? After that amazing experience, which still seems so absolutely real to me, I was convinced that I had left my body. All this scientific work and research and everything that's gone on in those 30, 46 years has led me to be more like the guy at the back, <laughs> you know, to ask, why do I seem to be inside my body anyway? Because I am not. There's a construction there, and that's useful for getting around in the world, but it's illusory. And so I hope that by understanding the out-of-body experience in a non-dual way, by seeing how it arises in the brain, we can not only do justice to how the experience feels and how it felt to me, but to me it helps to let go of the idea that there's someone terribly important in here who gives lectures and uh, will live forever and go to heaven, because it won't and there isn't. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>